Hey Chem Kids, Mrs. Campbell here. In today's video, we're going to talk about the history of the development of atomic theory. So let's go way back. In the very beginning, back around 400 BC, there was this guy, Democritus, and Democritus actually proposed that all matter was made up of atoms. And these atoms were these solid, indestructible spheres that were indivisible with liberty and justice. Oh, wait, that's the wrong subject. But anyways, he called these atomos, of course, because he was Greek. And that's the Greek word for indivisible. The problem was he had no proof. And there were lots of philosophers out there at the time that were saying that everything was made out of fire and earth and wind. So it's kind of largely forgotten. And then much, much later, we start to have new discoveries about the atom. Remember our friend Lavoisier? He came up with the law of conservation of matter. Well, he proved that the whole earth, wind, fire thing was not true. In fact, he proved that fire was actually a chemical reaction. And then the later development by John Dalton. John Dalton was actually a school teacher. Cool who in the 1800s came up with what we call now modern atomic theory. And most of it is pretty true today. He said that each element is composed of small particles called atoms. Hmm, heard that before. That atoms of different elements are different. So the atom of that makes up iron is different from the atom that makes up gold. That atoms aren't created or destroyed in a chemical reaction. Hmm. Pretty sure we heard that before. And that compounds always have the same ratios of the same atoms. So if there's water, water always has two hydrogens and an oxygen. And if I have carbon dioxide, well, carbon dioxide always has one carbon and two oxygens. Pretty cool. Well, time goes by and we have this guy named Crux, William Crux in England. And he came up with what's called the Crookes tube, which later we called the cathode ray tube. And basically, it's a vacuum tube that has these metal plates on the end that we connect to electricity and we connect it to a high voltage source. We get this beam of light. And he discovered, or he said, that this was a stream of negatively charged particles. The problem was there's a lot of controversy around this at the time. In Europe, it was commonly thought that this was some... Um, disturbance of the ether. I have a cathode ray tube. Let's take a look at it. Come on, let's go. So I have here a cathode ray tube. On the one end here, you can see a metal plate. If we give this baby enough electricity, we're going to get electrons to leave that plate and move across the tube. So let's do it. All right. Pretty cool, huh? Well, uh, interestingly enough, there's this guy, J.J. Thompson, who was working at Cambridge. And J.J. Thompson started playing around with this cathode ray tube. And he found that he could deflect that beam with electric and magnetic fields, proving that this wasn't some light disturbance, that this was actually a negatively charged particle, which he called a corpuscle. Now we call it the electron. But so J. Thompson is the one who discovered the electron. Now, what he knew is that atoms were neutral. So if we have this negatively charged particle, what's up with it? So he came up with his model of the atom, which is called the Plum Pudding Model. So what the Plum Pudding Model is, is that we've got this mass of positively charged pudding. And in our positively charged pudding, we have our negative electron plums. And they're evenly distributed through the pudding. So let's keep going. We get to the 1900s and we've got awesome guys like Albert Einstein and Max Planck. We're actually gonna talk more about him when we talk about quantum theory. So next comes in Robert Millikan from the USA. Yay, USA! Robert Millikan actually did this really cool oil drop experiment that determined the mass on an electron. And using information developed by J.J. Thompson, he was able then also to determine the charge on the electron. Pretty cool, huh? After came along Ernest Rutherford, and Ernest Rutherford was studying this model of the atom. 
this plum pudding model. And so he set up this experiment where he shot alpha particles, well, actually his associates like Geiger shot alpha particles, um, through gold foil. And he postulated that if this plum pudding model works, right, then all these alpha particles will just go right through the gold foil and end up on the other side. But in fact, what he found is that some of the alpha particles will deflect it, and some actually even bounce back. What the heck? Well, after lots of postulating, what he came up with was there must be a mass concentrated in the center of the atom. That would explain the scattering and bouncing sometimes. So this is called the nuclear atom. So Rutherford, through his gold foil experiment, proposed that atoms positively charge and most of its mass is actually there in the middle. We call that a nucleus. And then the electrons are all on the outside. Oh, there's Geiger right there. Uh, after that comes Schrodinger. Schrodinger actually proposed the electron cloud theory of the atom, and we'll talk more about that when we get into quantum mechanics. Our last part of our journey here is James Chadwick. In 1931, James Chadwick, Chadwick discovered the neutron. Holy cow, that wasn't that long ago. Well, that's it through our journey through time and atomic theory. Let me ask you a couple questions. Who was the first person to propose the idea that matter was not infinitely divisible? Aristotle, Plato, Dalton, or Democritus? If you said Democritus, you are correct. 400 BC, problem is no proof. Dalton's theory, right, his atomic theory, also conveniently explained what? The electron, the nucleus, the law of conservation of mass, or the law of Democritus? I didn't know there was a law of Democritus. If you said the law of conservation of mass, you are correct. Cool. See you in class.